Jack Dapper Blues Heritage Preservation Foundation is a tax-exempt 501c3 nonprofit private foundation. Your donations, sponsoring, and funding allows us to create content that raises awareness of African American traditional music, African American folklore, and the black experience. Check the link in the description box to donate. If you wish to sponsor podcasts, documentary series, or underwrite ads in our newspaper, The African American Folklorist, contact the email address in the description box. Afternoon, folks. The Blue Ridge Boy here. I'm going to play a little bit of the Blue Ridge Boys Worried Man Blues. in the South, 
and in places like this as they travel. Some became great superstars. The Muddy Waters, who was initially recorded by John Wesley Work III and Alan Lomax. Some got their properties, so to speak, like Mance Lipcomb in the 60s revival who was playing at the turn of the century. You know, we revere these legends that of a hundred years ago. We revere these blues musicians, black blues musicians after they die. But I have on the line with me today a brother, a gentleman who is the epitome of the turn of the century and prior blues. I'd, I'd go as far as saying from 1890 to 1935. He sounds like those old tunes right now, and he's still alive, so we're going to celebrate him right now because he's really living the life of a traveling bluesman, of a Henry Thompson. So as we get into his story, we're going to continue to ask you for support for this brother who is living the life of a bluesman. And I'm speaking with the Blue Ridge boy himself, brother Eric Freeman. What's happening, man? Hey, how's everybody doing? Staying blues, man. Yo, we, we, we're maintaining. How are you doing, yeah, brother? You, you, you're on some hard times. Yes, I am. I'm going through hard times, but you know what? The Lord will make a way. So I have always followed the path of God. So, you know, even though I don't live the perfect life, I'm a true believer. Because without you, it would be nothing. I mean, that's, and, the, that's the truth. That's, that is the 100. That's where it's happening. It's like, I pray every day that something good comes along to me. I struggle, you know, I've been homeless for years. I just, uh, I got a car recently. Now I have to give it back because the person that gave it to me, we had a disbelief in the whole coronavirus thing. They're, they're pushing the issue like, uh, for instance, if I have a conversation with someone, they butt in and they shouldn't be when I'm not talking to them, you know, and it brings negativity towards me and those, and those people. So, I'm refraining from from dealing dealing with that. You know, I was happy that I had a car, but you know what? If I got to live somebody else's life to make me happy, then I don't want to fix people. Well, you know what I'm saying? You know, I dig it, and that's a great segue to get into your life and your story because mm -hmm. um, a lot of us have been on this journey with you for a, a couple, a, a few years, and I mean. One can say you're a legitimate African American, Native American, traditional music jukebox. There's not much you can play that comes out of the black story. I mean, to be honest, I don't think there's anything you can't play <laughs> from what I've witnessed. <laughs> so, so let's well, start with the beginning of 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 your journey into the music first and then we'll get into okay. everything else. When did you pick sure, up sure. the guitar? I first picked up the guitar in September the twentieth of nineteen ninety three. Wow. I yeah, that's when I started uh the reason I started playing music, uh is because I was bored. I got in some trouble when I was younger and I had to do a couple of days in jail, you know, for a minor crime. And while I was there, the gentleman, uh, his name was David Lancer, a hippie gentleman from uh, Rapp County County, where I'm from in Virginia, he played the guitar. He's a really, really good guitar player. He got kind of crazy and goofy. But man, he could really, really, really play the guitar. And so it was like a big inspiration to me. I remember the first thing he ever played for me was, uh, Walking Prison Blues by Johnny Cash. Mm. He took a piece of note, he took a piece of notebook paper and wrapped it around the guitar string and played the rhythm, the lead part with it, you know, and he like inspired me. So after I had been out of jail for I don't know, a couple months, I was looking for something for my sister. 
for a birthday, which is September the 20th. And so I was in a town called Culpeper, Virginia, and I walked by the store uh, and I saw this guitar. I said, you know what? I'm going to buy me a guitar. So I had the money to buy her a gift and a guitar. So I bought a guitar. And I had a cousin that lived down a road below me named Robert Baxter. He had a bunch of Lionel and Jefferson records, uh, Mississippi John Hurt's Last Death in the Taxi Sky, uh, John Jackson's National Down Home Blues, and my uncle had uh, Yazoo cassette case, 1063, mm. uh, of, Brian, of Brian Blake, Ragtime Formal Singer Picker. That's how I got my start. So, okay. Did you just listen and train yourself by ear? Did you get any pointers, any teaching? How did that work? Well, how did how I really got really deep into it? Uh, I learned the chords from the alphabet, so like the shapes of the upper cases. Mm-hmm. I learned the I learned the chords from the alphabet because if you notice, I have, you can train your mind like an uppercase A in the same way as the first position A that people show you like in the second fret where you cram up all three fingers and shove them in the second fret. Mm. And, you know, I started visualizing, you know, how everything would work, how the chords and stuff work. Then I started listening to voices and stuff. And then I thought then after that, somebody told me what the notes was. So my first encounter with uh, a real movement was John Jack. Oh, the wow. thing with Pete Mabuse, the thing with Pete Mabuse, the star player, he was from my singing family. And, and actually, John and John's brother, he had an older brother named Jack Jackson, he was a real, real good guitar player. He played like John Hurt, Brian Blake. So he's one of those guys who wouldn't show you anything. But anyway, he and my grandfather were good friends. They used to play music together. And so, <clears throat> anyway, once I started learning music, I... I had a side job being an auger doing tree work and, uh, you know, hard work, landscaping and stuff. Well, the man I worked for, he knew where John Jackson lived. So I had met John as a child, like in 1976, 77, but you know, I didn't know anything about me. So in the 90s when I was working, uh, a gentleman by the name of Willie Stillman, who's passed on there, he took me by John's house. And I sit down, told him who I was. And I went out and I bought his stuff and I, he, first time he showed me the speed of the highway of the CSE. And after that, you know, once I got voices in my ear, I could take a song and break it down. And I would listen to the notes and I learned how to, how to tune the guitar, learn how to play. And then it got to the point where, you know, I could listen to one of his songs and figure out what the notes were and I'd play it for me in the song. That was my first encounter. Uh, uh, my next, yes, sir, my next encounter was with John Keefer. Um, really? The same I worked for, yeah, the same gentleman I worked for was a gentleman who knew where John Keith lived. So John Keith lived about probably an hour and a half, maybe an hour and 45 minutes away from me. So on Saturday, we would pack up and just go down and spend, you know, hours with John. I would go down and take my uh, cassette tape and stuff that I had bought that I'd work to pay money for. And I'd go and I'd record uh, Brian Blake Fuller and Brian Blake and all these different artists. So once I learned the difference between Delta and Piedmont and Ragtime and Open and all that, that's how I got my start. Um, from from John Deeper came John D. Holden. Mm. I went and spent a couple of, I went to spend a couple of days with him down in Durham, North Carolina. He showed me like what the old juke houses were like with alcohol and women and, <laughs> and, and all that stuff. So I hung out with him for a while. So that happened. And then after that, uh, my next encounter was Archie Edwards. I went Archie to, Edwards. uh, yeah, I went to Archie's barbershop one Saturday and sit back there and had a little drink of white lightning in the back of the, uh, <laughs> of the barbershop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's how those four guys right there are pretty much my, my, my team, my father. That's how I really got into it. So, you know, I would listen to each one of them play. Each one of them got a different style, so and I would go and I would I would sit and listen and I learned that stuff. I bought the uh the home the house party that John Jackson the other day, I guess it's in the late eighties or early nineties, the blues house party. And I probably watched that thing a million times with, with all the different musicians there with Floor Moulton, Phil Williams, 
Um, let's see, Eleanor Ellis. I know Eleanor's real good. Eleanor uh, is great. <laughs> uh, she's great. She's great. I know several musicians. Uh, I know uh, um, Neil Hart, uh, Roy Bookbinder. Wow. Um, yeah, I know great many guys. I used to go to the workshop and hang around, and then uh, that was up in, in West Virginia. Um, yeah, in West Virginia. Yeah, yeah, in David Falcons at David Falcons College. Right, I, I attended one year. That's where I met Eleanor and mm. Phil. Great folk. Yeah, great folk. Uh, I met uh, I met several people. Mary Flower. I met her up there. Uh, who else? Um, Maybe Jeff Baker, I'm not a I think I saw him up there once, uh, Lightning Wells. Um, I met several, several artists, Eddie Pennington, me and his son Lonzo. So I met several, several different artists up there. So that's how I, that's pretty much how I got my starting from the music business. So, so and then I just, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. Then you just what? Go ahead. <clears throat> I was just going to say that's how I pretty much got my start into everything. Mm -hmm. Now, now cause, cause my, my question is going to sway from the journey and we're going to sure. come to, to the now for a moment. The last three years, a lot has happened. What, my, yes, now, I know Mr. Cephas transcended, but uh, Phil Wiggins is doing a lot of big things. Eleanor Ellis is still performing in all of those that come out of that um that that team that you mentioned and that uh camp none of these people reached out to you or you reached out to them well i have reached i have reached out to them you know i don't know at one time you know things wasn't good for me i wasn't a good person you know I, i'll be honest I'm super real. a long time ago i had a bad uh you know, drug addiction, but I overcame it, you know, and maybe that had weight on people from them, you know what I'm saying? No, I understand. So it's a good yeah, it's a good possibility, you know, I'll, I'll keep the real work real, that, you know, but I overcame that, and since then, you know, I've just been trying to, to get into it, you know, I post videos all the time, you know, but I do have a, a gig coming up at the coronavirus relief, and, uh, uh, so it's been May the 9th in Lawrence, South Carolina. I don't think this is going to happen now. With all that is going on right now, <laughs> I, I think that is a, no, that's going to be a no-no. So, then a lot of has happened. You know, I mean, I I used to live in Seattle. I got on a record label there with uh, a man by the name of Bob West. He, had a, he owned a record company called Arco Records. So in 2011, I moved to Seattle because years before that, I used to go to Fort Townsend and uh, I was a liaison. I'd show people around and, and you know, I'd go, I'd go to the workshop and stuff and I got to, I got to see quite a few classes. You know, I got to meet Honey Boy Edwards. Oh, wow. I got to meet, uh, yeah. I got to sit down and talk to him. I met Brink Small, um, Robert Belfort. So, yeah, I've had, uh, and actually, uh, Lily Bell, he and I, we met at the airport in Seattle. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, so, the, so the Port Jefferson um, a camp, so to speak, you was also a part of that for some time because that, that's another one that has been ringing big bells. I've become aware of it within the last couple of years. Mm hmm Yeah. So you was there also so, and you taught classes there, you said, or just attended? No, I taught classes. I've never had a guitar lesson in my life. Wow. Uh that's the truth. I, uh, all those videos you hear me post, and I, what I do is, I try to channel all those guys. So I want to see what they're singing about. Like, you know, I don't have the world's greatest voice, but a lot of those blues men, you know, they went to church. You know, I never had to go to church to ring up. So maybe if I was with the church work and learn my vocals, right. things would have been much better. So and that's where it's definitely, that's where I come from. Well, so, you have, but you do have a distinct voice. Matter of fact, let's get into another one of these uh, songs. Again, everyone, sure. these songs are coming All from right. his YouTube page because this is real folklorist work and, and Brother Eric does real field recording. I, I want to get into your version of Robert Wilkins' That's No Way to Get Along. And, you know, your voice okay. does sound good on that. 
Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. You have Eric Freeman, the Blue Ridge Boy, and I'm going to show you a version of a Robert Wilkins song, That's No Way to Get Along. Capo in the third fret. Um, open D tuning, D, A, D, F sharp, A, D. So, and, and he, the opening riff starts on the one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh and eighth fret with a bend. An alternating bass. understand that in a lot of these a lot of these videos are not just Eric playing the songs for you performing for you but they're instructional videos and I, I have to say because in 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 a time where there's a lot of debate of who does the blues belong to which is preposterous off the gate a lot of people want to learn how to play these songs. And, and this is our traditional expression, right? So you have natives, you have Asians, you have Hawaiians, you can go down the list. And a lot of their traditions and expressions are protected by the federal government so it cannot be exploited. We have not gotten the blues to that point as of yet however that does not mean you should take advantage of this brother who is is giving you this history and these, these these musical lessons by not paying him you know so now with that being said you do uh produce instructional videos for those who wish to learn this style of music right correct i do I've been looking for someone to uh, sit down with me and use two cameras, you know, to show my left and right hand mm -hmm. to, to make it e to make it easier. That's what I've been trying to do. So I don't know what I need to do to make it happen, but that's been a big operation, you know, for me to want to do that, you know. It's like I do it, first of all, for the love, but also, you know, I, I know I, I, I rant sometimes on Facebook, you know, please forgive me. But it's because it's like, when is it going to be my break? Because I have done a lot of homework. I have done a lot of studying. I mean, I have put my heart, soul, blood, sweat, and tears into learning this music. I mean, nights, I have stayed up hours at many, many nights learning these songs. I mean, I learn songs in my sleep sometimes. It's like, but the song I really want to learn, I... I put on headphones and I put the one song on repeat all night long and lay down and go to sleep by when I'm in a comfortable place. 
And then the endorphins in my brain get to work. And, and nine out of ten, when I get up the next morning, I can play that song. That's how I. That's how I learn how to how to play the stuff that I do. Mm. So, yeah. So yeah. now I know I, I do have a copy of one of your albums, Rattlesnake mm-hmm. Baby. What's going on with this album? Because it was out for a while. I was able to get a copy. I played it when I was on um, uh, WFDU HD2 89.1. I, I played R- it a R- lot. Rattlesnake and Daddy? Yeah, Rattlesnake and Daddy. Daddy yeah. I used to play that on the air. Man- the man that recorded me, Bob West, from Seattle, Bob passed away. And then after he passed away, you know, all the copies that he had given me, which was recorded in Dextroff uh, Studio mm-hmm. in Seattle, um, I didn't have any way to get a hold of them or get the masses or anything. So that's what happened with that whole CD. So I sold quite, you know, quite a few of them. But then after he passed away, you know, I had no access to getting any more. What do you What do you mean? You had no access to get? Anyway. Well, I don't know who to contact because he's dead it's right here, you know. So, so this is what happened to avoid a whole lot of licensing and fees and stuff. He gave me my own record company label thing. So his company was called Arcola Records. So if you look on the back of my CD, mine says Eric Cola. So he did that to avoid having to get into his record company, you know, and. So that's what happened with that. Mm. So <clears throat> who has the masters now? I guess it would be whoever is his, uh, whoever's taking over his houseboat or whatever in, in Seattle, or maybe Jack Straw Studios may have it, which is located in Seattle. So okay. That's well. the one or two, that's the one or two factors. So. Now, but now you also had an opportunity to play on some real notable blues recordings, right? Yes, I did with uh, with Bonnie McCoy, who was meant to me, great me. Wow, that yeah, that's history for you. How was that? How did that come about? That came that came about when I was in Seattle. <clears throat> I just happened to be uh, over at Bob West's house, which is uh, he had a house boat in Seattle, and so Bonnie was in town. And so Bob used to go down in the 60s when the whole folk court movement happened. Bob used to travel a lot of places. He had a job working for, for Boeing, and he had a, but he had a side job at a radio company. And so what happened was he would go and travel and try to find all these blues artists that were living. So he went and recorded uh, Ethel and George McCoy and Henry Townsend and all these people. And so when he told me that Bonnie McCoy was in town, and she was nothing many great news. She was like, I'm going to do a CD. And I would like to have you around. I'm like, okay, well, we'll try to work something out. So I met her, and we sit down. And when she heard me play uh, a couple songs of Memphis Minnie, she was like, she, was like, she started crying. She was like, oh, my God, she goes, you are a real blues man. She goes, I've never met anyone like you before. Mm. So from that point, from that point, we worked out uh, Shelter and Bumblebee. Mm. So that's how the that's how the CD came to be. So, you know, and then there's other artists on the CD too. And I've recorded, you know, a couple other CDs that I really haven't done anything with. I had one CD that I sent a man over in Michigan who was going to mix and try to put it together, uh, but nothing ever came out of it. So, I mean, and, and, you, I, and I, I that mean, particular I, one, you own the rights and licensing to, right? Well, yeah, it's because it's, it's been it's been nothing done to it. It's my what I did. I did a tribute album to to like twenty four artists. So I recorded uh, a, one song by John Hurt, Scrapper Blackwell, Brian Blake, Blind Boy Fuller, Lemon Jefferson, Sterling Lewis, Buffalo White, Charlie Patton, Robert Johnson, so on and so on. So I did one song by by. Uh, one of those artists, by each one of those artists. And then after that, I didn't do anything with it because Bob passed away. I recorded in Seattle with Bob West. Okay. We're doing some, uh, we're doing like some, uh, oh, we're doing some Miss of Mini style. We're doing uh, Little Buddy Doyle, stuff like that. So. so now you also said that you've done your homework. So that means you 
not only know how to play these songs, but you know the history of the songs of the people in the regions. Yes, I know the history of the songs of the people. So when I was first learning the the guitar, um, I would always read the liner notes and see where the people come from. And I haven't been to everybody's hometown, but I have been a lot of places, you know, to check these guys. So I've been through Mississippi. I've been through North Carolina. Um, I've been through a little bit of Texas, not where man lives from, where like the hockey comes from. But I did, you know, my research, my homework, you know, I listened, you know, and I listened to the album, listened to, you know, what their daily life was, you know. Like, I'd watch the videos of them talking about, you know, how they had to work and, you know, and then come home and play music, you know, play music all night and get up and go to work. And how they had to practically, you know, work their fingers to the bone for nothing. But yeah. they still, but, you know, but they were happy, you know, and they, they, they made a living the best way they could. You know, times are tough, just like it is right now. That's you right. Know, Not much has changed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So exactly. let's, let's, let's take it from, so you, you, you went to Seattle, you were meeting and recording and, and you were in mm-hmm. festivals. What happened from that point to, to now that, that kind of broke I, the, the forward movement? I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. Um, I guess, yes. Maybe because of some things that went on in my life, I, I really don't know. It's like, uh, since then, I, there's been a whole lot, you know, it's like I have contacted people. I I just don't know. I really can't put my hand on it. You know, if somebody would tell me, and maybe if there's something I've done, maybe I can fix it. You know, I don't know. I'm only fix it if somebody's going to tell me, you know, if I did something to somebody or or some people or if it's something that I just did personally or whatever, you know, like, <laughs> So do you yeah, think was, that you've been mad. blackballed? Is what you're saying? That could be. That could be a possibility. It could be. I can't say for sure. No one has ever said that. But anything is possible in life. Mm. And if and if it would be that, I would think that if a person that calls himself a man or a human being, they would have enough decency to tell me. You know, then that way I would wouldn't have to continue to worry about you know. If I did this wrong, I did that wrong. So right, that way, so if I did do something wrong, go ahead. Who, who, who would have the power to do this, Would be, I guess would be the question. And if that's the case, maybe this is the person that, that uh, would need to be spoken with. Maybe the people that have pull in the, in the music business, probably some of the top-notch people, because I've tried everything. Like, I've even went online. I even submitted all kinds of things to new stuff in New Mexico, like California, all these places, you know, um, any place I thought that I might get a gig at, you know, I have sent emails. We'll get back in touch with you. And just like I'm supposed to be doing the uh, Petunia Fest for, uh, for, Curly, for Curly Weaver. Mm. Okay. Now, I had made an agreement with, uh, with Curly Weaver's grandson. Okay. Okay. And another gentleman, I, another gentleman, I think what his name is right now. Oh, uh, Mr. Got Tony? Face, sorry. Yeah, t- Tony is the grandson. Right. Now, I had, yeah, I made a deal with him, and then he called me back in that day and said, no, they're going to get somebody else. And so there was another gentleman that knew him that had put me in contact with him. He was a little upset. He's like, man, I really want to be on that show. So, I mean, I tried, you know, it's like we agreed one day and the next day, they shut it down. Mm. Uh, it changed his mind. So, see, that's the, that's the way things are been, you know. And, and and he also wanted me to do And I even stayed in between here, you know. He's like, well, we'll pay X amount of dollars. I said, look, just give me X amount of dollars to make sure I got a trip there and back. Right. That's all I want, you know. And... It just didn't work out. I mean, and I even undercut myself. I even took a, a pay cut to mm-hmm. try to get the game. That's the truth. That's the 100. Okay, so. So that's the way. Well, I, I, mm-hmm. Let's, let's. I, when did it start turning around for the worse? Give, give us a timeline from the point till now. Oh, I'd say. 
probably 2000 and, um, 15 or 16 when I got, that's when I got stabbed and I ended up being homeless. You got and, stabbed? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I got stabbed. Okay, so, sure all right, let's talk about this because, again, a lot of people uh, talk and portray the blues life, and for that matter, the hip-hop life, which is the same thing. But mm-hmm. it, it sounds like, as I said in the beginning, you, you're a real live bluesman and living the life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so oh, yeah. what? talk to us. If, if there's no uh, legal ramifications, talk to us about that story, how it happened, and what transpired after to start making things turn, I guess, for the worse. Right, well, I lived in San Diego, and uh, after I used to be married, so after Bob passed away in Seattle, you know, I just didn't feel like being there anymore. And plus, my, my marriage was in the rock. So, um, I had met another lady from San Diego that was in Seattle. So, you know, I'd been divorced probably a year. So, I decided I wanted to change. So, I moved to San Diego in 2013, and we hit it off pretty good. You know, I had a pretty good job. But then... My back went out. That's why I don't work anymore. You know, people are like, you need to get a job. Well, my, I physically cannot work because I have five foot discs and I have a bad side of the nerve in my back. And, you know, and I have off in my back. So, and I've been trying to get money through the government and we're saying shut it down. Well, anyway, so. And you were in I the hospital to, for uh, quite a few times. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I was. And so, when I didn't get the money from the government, of course. <laughs> It's really expensive in San Diego. So my ex-girlfriend and I, we ended up getting into an argument because of the bill. And, you know, because the rent was just eighteen eighteen hundred dollars a month. So anyway, I ended up moving out on the street, being homeless. I went to a mission at first, but then the mission got to be too much for me because we got to be where it was a control thing. And then come to find out the people that were running the mission they were taking a lot of money from older folks and, and just, they were taking a check and stuff. Mm. So I don't want to be no part of that. Yeah. So anyway, um, at the present time when I got stabbed, I had a really beautiful nickel plate at Resonate. All right. And I used to do a lot of street performing. I was making money. But anyway, one night on my way home, a guy come out of the alley and from behind, I used to walk down the street saying my guitar all the time, not thinking nothing about it. And so he gets me from my, and he stabbed me. Right, that was right next to my heart. Wow. And I had to, I had, yeah, I had to run three or probably three blocks. I'm not a runner by far, but I had a backpack on and I had my guitar. And so I have a video of me laying in the hospital bed. But I got my guitar back. But how I ended up losing it was I got into a, an altercation with a guy one night, and then a couple people ganged up on me and got the guitar. Oh my that's goodness. what happened. My friend. Yeah, my friend Zachary Cole, who's a harmonica player that he'll tell you. So that's what happened. And that's why, you know, sometimes when I get on Facebook and stuff and ask people for donations, it's just because, you know, it's like I've been trying so hard for years to get into music. I've been trying real hard to get this done and that done. And it just seems like every road I turn, there's always some sort of roadblock. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so that's what that's where it's at for me, you know. It's not like I, I don't want to ask people for anything. But it, it, just, it bothers me sometimes when I see people that haven't worked as hard as I have get everything handed to me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, right. not saying nothing bad. I want I want people to have plenty in life. And, you know, and I've tried so, and that's where and that's where it's been at for me. You know, and yes, I've had to borrow money from people, and and if, and if I could get up on my feet, all the people that never helped me up, I would sure give them. You know, money back in the fifteen times thousand more. You know, if I had it because you know they helped me when I needed it the most. Well, you know, and I will never forget that. Let's. I, I want to. You you mentioned earlier, and again, this is about your story. So nothing is is. Um, to to put you on the spot, okay. But you sure. mentioned at one time you had a bad drug problem and that now you've recovered, which is a blessing. Let's let's talk about that 
Because maybe sure. if you discuss that and, and discuss how you went from that place, how you got to that place, got through that place mm-hmm. to the other side, some of the people who may be st- continuing to hold that against you can see you, you, you've, you, you're not okay. in that place anymore. Do you understand? Sure, I totally, totally. Ask me whatever you want. So what, what were you on? How did it start? What was going on at that time? At the time, I was smoking crack cocaine in the real. And the addiction got bad. I ended up, I ended up borrowing money from people, and I couldn't pay it back because I was eating the addiction so bad, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now I got, now I got rid of it. Um, I went to a rehab. I was in a rehab for ooh, probably mm, six months, and then when I got out, I didn't, I didn't drink. This is when I was in Seattle. I didn't drink or smoke. I've been clean for probably 15 years or better. That's a blessing. Every bit of it. Yeah. Who introduced so, it to you? you know, I first learned about that stuff in the in the 80s when I was working for a gentleman back in Virginia. This white gentleman took me, uh, got me to take him somewhere one day. Matter of fact, I was 18 years old when I first started. I'm, I'm, I don't remember the exact day, but I remember how old I was. I had my first car. And I took him there to to purchase some, you know. I didn't do it all the time, but then once once I got older, you know, and I found out that what you could do with a drug, how you could like pretty much make someone bow down to you, you could be like a king or whatever, that I took it to that level. Mm. You know, for for to ruin me, you know. To try to be in power of something, you know. To try to be in power of something that has power over me, it don't work that way. Right, right. So I, I learned a hard, hard lesson in life. Hard, hard lesson, you know. So that's what that's for me. But you, but you, but you've made it to the other side, and this is what we want. I made to it. Hear. I made it to the other side. I made it to the other side, and I haven't looked back. You know, I got to the point to where uh, at one time I put the guitar down for a while because you know I wasn't. I wasn't feeling it anymore because I was keeping the addiction, you know. So I've been playing the guitar now for um, 26 years. That's when I've been playing it for. Yeah. And it's like, I learned something new every time I pick it up. You know, I've had it on my guitar and stuff before. I, I, I've been down that road. I've lived a life for the two years and I'm still living, you know. But I think, you know, I think the good Lord above that I can get up every morning. And then I can pray. I carry a Bible with me all the time. I got a little New Testament, older New Testament in my pocket. And I try to read scriptures every day. I'm not perfect. I mean, I drink. I do not get drunk. I used to I used to get drunk. I don't get drunk anymore. And so that's where I get to. You know, that that is Eric Freeman's life. You know, I I have a drink here and there, you know. I might even smoke a little bit of marijuana here and there. But I don't party nowhere near as I used to, you know. Uh, number one, I don't want to do it anymore. Number two, I'm older, you know. And number three, if you're trying to be somebody, you got to end it for a you know. Right. So that's, no, so I understand. That's like all that for me. No, I, I definitely understand. And I mean, you, 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 you do live a modern version of what they used to call hobo blues of the Henry Thompson, uh, man, exactly. type cast. I want to play the song. Because it, it kind of feels like now is a, a, a good time to play this song by you. Uh, again, it's on your YouTube page. Folks who are listening, you can go to Eric Freeman at YouTube and subscribe to him. You can also donate in the link we're going to have um, where you can donate. And we're going to get to some more talking after this song. And this song is God Knows I Can't Help You.
Yes. So now, <clears throat> I know there was a time once you had moved from Seattle to uh, San Diego, you were busking there, but busking there was not legal. Is that, is my understanding correctly? Um, it's, you can, in some places you can, some places you can't. So I would go to, to, uh, another part of San Diego in the West. I would go busking over there and, uh, people were cool with it. But downtown in some places, the way it works in San Diego, if the place is shut down, you can bus there. But in some places that are open, you can stay there, but it's more or less, they don't want, they feel that as if you're in competition. Uh. So I like, when a place is open. Now I got real lucky one time in San Diego. I was playing in front of the Horton Plaza Theater buses. Uh, Taj Mahal and John Hyatt were in town. And a lady gave me a $1,000. That's the most blessing I ever gotten from anyone playing the guitar. She sat down and listened to me for probably an hour. She goes, how did you get so good on the guitar? And, you know, and I explained to her where I come from and how I learned music and stuff. And anyway, from that point, the lady that was running the theater, she came mm-hmm. out and she goes, I got some for you. She gave me five tickets. I got to meet Taj Mahal once. Wow. And John I is there at the, yeah, in town. So that's the only time I got to see him. But it was really nice. Taj Mahal's a big dude, man. He's huge. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I got, I got to meet him there, yeah. So. Did you get a chance to play yeah, for so. or with him? No, because he was really busy. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you really, really busy. Man, I mean, yeah. this this is 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 just almost amazing because this is a, a modern day practitioner that is is a, a direct reflection of some of the things that we've read in the nineteen hundreds, in the early nineteen hundreds. <laughs> You know, yeah. is 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 almost amazing. So now I, I do remember in the in in the process of things not going so good in San Diego, and mm-hmm. um, you having uh, issues busking because you're getting ticketed and and things, and, and I think arrested a couple of times. You were trying to get to New Orleans or some to get to French Quarters or something to that effect. Walk us through that. Yeah. So uh, my good friend in New York City, Don Aaron. Hey Don, Don what's happening? Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah, Don is a great dude, man. He he is a fabulous gentleman. Fabulous, fabulous. I didn't know back for that man if he needed me for something. He has helped me out, you know, quite a few times, more times than I can even like tell you. But because he cares and he's really interested in what I do well, he helped me get to to New Orleans. Because I told him I was proud of San Diego. I want to go somewhere and do music because I guess that's been my aspiration. Like every town I've been into, I went there for music, just like here in Nashville. And so once again, once I go and I play and I try to do something here in Nashville, well, the coronavirus comes up. So now, right. <laughs> see what I'm saying? Right. So you're it's, in Nashville now. So, yes, I'm in Asheville, North Carolina right now. Oh, Asheville, Asheville, North Carolina. Yeah, Asheville, yeah, Asheville, yeah, yeah. Okay. Asheville, so yeah. how how did it work in in New Orleans? What what happened there? I, I played uh, in a place called Bamboo. I played at the Black Cat. I played at the Blue Nile. More or less, uh, people have never told a lie to me. Not to sound racist or anything, because I'm not racist by far. Some people saying, it. but it's like when a black man that can really play acoustic blues or whatever steps up on the scene which is predominantly white there's a lot of animosity there and people feel threatened well yeah and I mean it's because you're, you're looking at the original form of it so they don't know how to take it you're looking at what it really is exactly. I've had many people many many people see me with the guitar and, and think that they could out play me or, or try to cut heads with me on some stuff and I'm like I'm like, I don't want to do that. They're like, I bet you can't even pay the guitar. So then, of course, what would I do? I'd pull it out. I'm like, okay. <clears throat> I'm like, what artist do you want? And they call off something. I'm like, what's some Johnny Cash? What's some Hank Williams? Who do you want? Mm. And they were like, you know how to play that? I'm like, yeah, I do. I'm like, I play banjo too. I play that and the harmonica and uh, ukulele, you know, mm. and the kazoo. Uh, all self-taught. Every bit, of the, every bit of what I play is self-taught. I never went and sit down at a workshop and, you know, and recorded anything. Everything I did is from life's experiences. You know, that's, that's who Eric Freeman is, the Blue Ridge Board. 
<laughs> so let me ask you, did you find it, you know, because it's uh, slightly ironic that we got into this part of the conversation. Do you find it that this happens often or even in the uh, highbrow scenes, even like the uh, uh, older enthusiasts and academics do you find that that are non-black? Do you find that they have issue with you? Maybe not personal, but they kind of stay clear of you. And do you think it's because yeah. I don't know if it's music or maybe it's things that have happened in my life, but sometimes, yeah. Man, so w- be- before we continue to dive into that, let me sidestep and, and ask you, Blue Ridge Boy, what mm-hmm. what where did that name come from? Did you give it to yourself? Did someone give it to you? What What does it signify? My ex wife, because I come out of the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. I mm. come from I come from the mountain. Talk about being a country boy. Where I come from, I was five miles off of the main road, okay, mm. which is Route Two Eleven, Zachary Taylor Highway. I was twenty five miles west and twenty five miles uh, south of a grocery store or a liquor store. Or mm. laundromat, where I come from. So you lived in a food desert almost, pretty much. Yeah, so I grew up I grew up working on a farm. Uh, my very first job, I had a job digging thistles when I was old, probably 12, 13 years ago. When I got out of school in the summertime, my very first job, I worked for a man by the name of uh, John Marshall Clark. And I would take a grubbing hoe in the summertime when we got out for school, and I'd work. I made a dollar and ninety six cents an hour. I made fifteen dollars a day when I was a kid, mm. and that that's how I survived. You know, because we, I grew up dirt poor. You know, our house rent was a hundred dollars a month. I remember like was yesterday, our electricity bill was like twenty five dollars. But that's where I come from. You know, I come from one of those. Poor, we never had any running water in the house that I lived in until I was like fifteen or sixteen. And how we got that in, I had a little small job one summer working for my next door neighbor who was a plumber. And I took and I bought a water heater for my family and we had a double bowl sink in the house. I put the first bit of running water we had in our house. Me and the next door neighbor, I paid for it. And uh, I left home for my mother. She was a deep when I was 13. I moved in with my aunt and uncle. They gave me a better life, but they passed on that pretty much like 90 Ninety eight percent of my family is dead. Mm. My grandmother, my mother, my father. Yeah. I have two I have two grown daughters, twenty three and twenty two years old. They live in Virginia. You know, there's been a lot of lap time between my kids and myself, you know. So, you know, I need to get back on that, you know. But every time I try to put something together, like I said, there's always some sort of roadblock. And I have reached out to my kids and you know, if they want to come see me, but it's just been so long, you know, until I guess I don't know if they don't have nothing to do with me or if they're just, you know, not ready for it yet or or whatever. So that's where I come from. So that's the Appalachians. Yeah. Yep. I come out of the mountains. Wow. Yep. So, oh man, um, that's, that's kind of rough there. I, I, I do know based on wisdom passed down to me by my oldest brother, bless the dead. That that mm-hmm. moment will come when uh, you and your kids will be able to reunite. And, you know, it, I, it may not be easy, but it may feel like no time has passed. Hopefully, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Totally, totally agree. So wait a minute. You said that your wife gave you that name. Your ex-wife gave you the name Blue Ridge Boy because that's where you come from. Yeah, that that and she. She's not my kid's mother. She, she's just, uh, I had two, this is two different women. So my ex-wife, who I was married to when I went to Seattle, she, she was a really good singer. She's the same country like Dolly Parton. She had a chance to go to Nashville when she was younger. Mm-hmm. She, before she, but she had a drug addiction too. And she, she cleaned us over now. She's doing really, really good. I mean, really, really good. So she had a chance to go to, to Nashville and make it one time, but she, she chose not to. And, we met at a music festival, uh, at a music festival, actually. And she didn't even know I played guitar. It's like until after, like, we had been dating a while. It's like, I went to a sister's house one day and just sit down there and had a guitar and banjo in the corner. I picked up and started playing. She goes, well, I didn't even know you could play like that. And she was floored. So she called her dad over to everybody. They're like, look at what he can do on the guitar and stuff. So anyway, once we, 
decided we wanted to get married. I said, look, I said, I, I have a CD that I have partially recorded in Seattle. I said, I can go back and finish it. Maybe something good will come out of it. So we just hopped on the bus. And we went to Richmond one Sunday. Her, her sister and son go over to the uh, Greyhound station. We hopped on the bus. We rode the bus for three and a half days going to Seattle from Virginia. Mm. Yeah. Did you write a song about I mean, that? Because you really from should. Virginia to Seattle. I did. I wrote a song called uh, Goodbye Virginia. You can find it on my Facebook page. Uh, just type in Eric Freeman, Goodbye Virginia. Uh, it's, sort of, it's sort of a sad song. Uh, it's, it's sort of like uh, sitting on top of the world. So I based my, my picking off of that song. Well, I wrote another song called The Virginia Rag, too. Mm, mm. So now, mm-hmm. so you guys were in, you met her in Virginia. You got married. Yeah, correct. And then you guys moved yep. to Seattle together. Yep. So sure did. And now she was a singer as well, but she she didn't perform with you. Well, yes, yes. And so, so I played in a couple different bands when I lived in Seattle. I had a band called West Side Mojo and a band called West Side Blues. So I played electric guitar. Uh, I played in four bands. I played in two electric bands and I played in two acoustic bands. So I had an electric band and an acoustic and another guy, I know, he had an electric band and an acoustic band. So I played in both bands. I played lead guitar in one, I played rhythm in the other. So... Wow. Okay. So when you so when you guys got when you guys touched down in Seattle, you mm-hmm. were about the business and you was out there uh, performing and everything. Well, yeah. Well, I took a chance. But when I first got there, uh, Bob didn't even know I was going to show up. It was storming and raining. I remember we got up at the airport. I mean, at the Greyhound station. It used to be on Ninth Avenue in Seattle. And I called him. He said, "Hey, what you doing?" I said, "Well, I'm here at the airport." He's like, "What?" I mean, at the Greyhound station, I'm like, he's like, he would? I said, yeah, I'm here in town. So he said, all right, it's going to take me a while to come get you. So he came over, picked me up, and I told him, I said, look, Bob, I said, I come here to do music. I said, I want to finish up the CD I got. He's like, well, he's like, this is all like, you're going to hit me all at once. So he didn't so, know that you were, cause, so you were going out there to meet him. He didn't know you were coming. Yeah, he didn't know I was coming. And and I left because I wanted I wanted to get a new start in life because you know everybody all my family had passed like my uncle was like my father he had died my aunt had died my mother was dead my father was dead it's like and my grandparents you know like everybody just died I grew up in a house with seven people when I left to come to to travel out west there were only two people alive myself uh, I'm sorry three people myself. Uh, my cousin from Meyer and his mother Diane, mm. who was my aunt Dolores' daughter. All right, so I grew up in the house with my aunt Sally, uh, my aunt Dolores, my uncle James, my cousin James. Okay, when I left to come to Seattle, all four of those people were dead. Wow. My aunt Sally, my aunt Sally, she died in the house when Storm Isabella. My aunt Dolores, the last thing I did for her, she had uh, she had cancer in the uterus. And mm. so when they opened her up, it spread out through her body. She died. My cousin James, she died from HIV. Um, and so and my cousin Diane, she just recently passed away here a couple months ago. Mm. She could see on Facebook. So it's like, I just like, I guess I sort of ran away from death. I just got tired of my family dying like that. You know? Right. It's like, when you used like a Christmas of 65 or 70 people versus the next year you go, it's like, Three or four people, you know, you get lonely. You get the lonely, you get feeling blue. That's what the blues is. It's a loneliness, a, a sadness on the inside of you. Now, it's not always about tears and, and everything, but it's just about that feeling that is deep within you, you know? Right, right, right. <laughs> so now, during all this time, because you mentioned that you've been working since a young dude, since a young guy in your, mm-hmm. your pre-teens, did you go to school? Yeah. Yeah, I I quit school in the 11th grade. I have a degree in all mechanics and small engines as well. I used to race. I built a race car. Uh, I'm really good at working on cars and stuff. So I went to a, I was pretty smart in school actually. I went to a, I went to a trade school uh, called Piedmont Technical Education in Culpeper, Upper Virginia. I got my degree in all mechanics and small engines. Mm. There, yeah. I mean, so and I quit. I quit school because it's like I wanted to work and make money and I was getting my GED at the time and my uh, GED instructor, I don't know if she had something against me. She's like, uh, 
Uh, like there's nobody, there's no way that anyone that acts as goofy and as crazy as you do can be as smart as you are. You know, and it just really hurt me. I quit school twice actually. Mm. I quit once, and my and my stepdad and my uncle got me to go back, and I went back, and I just didn't, I didn't feel comfortable. Mm. I just did not feel comfortable at all. So that's what happened. Man, this this is a true blues story, yeah. man. This is a true. Blue. So, what do you what would you like from the people? to receive from you with your story and your music? Well, I would just like for them to, now that they know what is going on in my life, maybe people will will, will see things a little different, see, see the lighter side of it, you know, in life now. So that's what it's for me, you know. It's, it, this is my life. So it's like when I tell people that how I'm struggling and being homeless on the street, it's like, you know, I just want some people to understand. Some people's like, I feel you, but unless you have experienced it, there, there's no way possible that you can feel that. You know what I'm saying? Right, yes. So, and, and I just want to, I want to continue doing music. I want the people to to love the blues and stuff and like the things I do, you know? And like, I know sometimes people are busy and can't, can't give donations or whatever, you know, or just acknowledge me a little bit more. That's all I'm asking, you know. If, if, if that's too much for me to ask, and so be it, I won't ask for that. You know, everybody needs acknowledgement for something. That, well, that's been something good that you have to offer people. No, absolutely. So now, we're, you're in Asheville, but you had mm-hmm. an accident recently, so uh, you, you, you're you not able to play at this time, right? I have two broken fingers. So I picked up the guitar here the other day and put a couple of videos up. I actually, I pulled the cast off of my hand because it's like, sometimes when I ask people for help, they can't do it, you know? Okay, so I said, you know what? Nobody's going to help me. I got to help myself. So I took the cast off and, and I tried to play. My hand is still hurting right now. I got a big old knot up on it. It's like somebody put an egg inside my hand. Mm. But my fingers are healing up. So that's where it's at for me. You know, that's why I haven't done any with my resonator or, or anything right now so because it's just too much right now. Oh. Are you able, is there places in Asheville, Carolina where you can bus? You can take this but any place here in Asheville. Okay, because it's, it's, you know, this it's like, it's, it's just mind blowing to me that this the, the change in society has affected everything because I, you know, I, rem, I remember you could walk down any street in any yeah. city or state and you have all, a lot of people busking and you don't, you, right, you're not correct. allowed to really do that anymore, right? Yep, true. Because so many people, I have to step outside for a minute, so many people that travel, like they're trained here, they dirty up the streets and they have dogs and these needles when they're doing dope and stuff and people just don't want to see it and then they flood the place with all kinds of things. You know, I mean, everybody has their own addiction and I have a lot of friends that are trained here that I'm expecting but that's, and that's on the real. That's where it's at. No, I dig it. Mm-hmm. I dig it. Yeah. Well, but we, we, we're going to definitely put your PayPal link in the description. Um, we're, we're, right. we're going to do a part two to this interview to get some more of your story. But as of now, All right. we, sure. we, we're, we're going to uh, close out you know, we're going to keep you in our prayers and we're all going to do uh, the best we can for you. I want to close out on your uh, song uh, by Buddy Moss. Um, all right. But is there anything that you want to tell the people other, that you haven't said before we, we close out? No, not yet. All right, brother. Well, it was good rapping to you. Stay safe out there. <laughs> And um, we, we, okay. we, we, I gotta play this song. All right. Because uh, Buddy Buddy Morse is a is a legend, and I'm sure you did it super duper justice. Okay. Uh, yeah. The only one thing I want to say is that if people really want to do some contributing, please feel free to do so. I'm not asking, but uh, if you feel so inclined, please help Eric Freeman out. All right, bro.